Human Rights Watch research in Indonesia shows a very worrying uptick in religious intolerance, which is being expressed in acts of intimidation, harassment, threats, and deadly violence. These incidents are occurring with alarming frequency uh, on a weekly basis, sometimes even on a daily basis. The perpetrators of this violence are vigilante-style thugs who follow a very traditionalist uh, strain of Sunni Islam. And who seek to impose their intolerance on the entirety of Indonesia. The Chukusik attack was really the most brutal attack that we've seen in Indonesia in recent years. A group of Islamist militants attacked a community of Ahmadiyya and bludgeoned to death three members of that community. Police were at the scene, but failed to adequately intervene. It's all too common in areas where religious minorities live that both the police and the local government officials fail to protect the minorities when they're under attack, and in some cases, actually assist the perpetrators in victimizing religious minorities. Building permits are a tool that local governments often use to restrict religious minorities from constructing houses of worship. The Philadelphia church has no church building and has to operate under constant harassment from militants, reading passages from the Quran. They've also been subjected to attacks with sewage and urine and garbage, even though there's a Supreme Court order that is supporting their right to build a new house of worship. The local authorities refuse to allow that to happen. Indonesia has a reputation internationally as a country which has successfully balanced religious diversity with religious tolerance and harmony, but that reputation is increasingly undeserved. President Yudhoyono needs to act decisively. He has to impose a zero-tolerance approach toward incidents of religious violence and intolerance. He needs to make clear that the victims will be protected, that the perpetrators will be punished, and the law will be enforced. Here in the United States, countless publications provoke offense. Like me, the majority of Americans are Christian, and yet we do not ban blasphemy against our most sacred beliefs. As president of our country and commander-in-chief of our military, I accept that people are going to call me awful things every day. And I will always defend their right to do so. It is time to leave the call of violence and the politics of division behind. On so many issues, we face a choice between the promise of the future or the prisons of the past. And we cannot afford to get it wrong. We must seize this moment. America stands ready to work with all who are willing to embrace a better future. Thank you so much. It is truly a great honor and pleasure to be here. I have to say that there is a particular sense of blessing that seems to rest on this uh, brimming room today, and I'm sure that that's due in part to the wonderful spirit of goodwill, the warm hearts, and the sense of optimism and love of the participants, but Your Holiness, it is undoubtedly a reflection of the blessing that you bring to this capital, and so we are so honored and so grateful to have you here. Speaking for all my USERF colleagues, and I want to recognize my very distinguished colleague, Aziz al Hibri, who serves with me on um, USERF, um, I am delighted to join members of Congress, His Holiness, and our gracious Ahmadiyya hosts here in our nation's capital. Soon you will hear His Holiness speak about his vision of peace and freedom among peoples and nations. This has been the Ahmadiyya message since its founding in 1889, well over a century ago. Indeed, when it comes to freedom of religion, 
There is unmistakable evidence that without freedom, there can be no peace. Nations which fail to protect the right to religious freedom fail to achieve peace within their own borders. All too often, they experience hatred and strife, violence and instability. In many of these countries, people have almost no idea what it's like to feel safe, secure, and truly free to live out their beliefs in peace as their conscience leads. Today, nearly 70% of the world's people live in such nations. This includes millions of members of the Ahmadiyya community. Since 1974, Pakistan's constitution has labeled all Ahmadiyya non-Muslims. For more than a quarter century, Pakistan's government has barred the community from calling its own worship centers mosques, from publicly uttering the traditional Islamic greeting, or quoting from the Quran, and from displaying Islam's basic affirmation. Throughout Pakistan, Ahmadiyya are prohibited from sharing their faith with others, or publishing or disseminating their own material. They are restricted from building houses of worship and holding public gatherings. And since they must register as non-Muslims to vote, Ahmadiyya, who insist they are Muslims as they surely are, are effectively disenfranchised. Coupled with Pakistan's blasphemy laws, which affect every faith community, these laws have helped foster a climate of violence against Ahmadiyya members. The terrible attack on Lahore mosques in May of 2010 was but one example. But sadly, Pakistan isn't the only country which violates the freedom of religion for Ahmadiyya. In Indonesia, since June of 2008, the government has seriously limited Ahmadiyya activity to private worship and prohibited members from telling others about their faith. Since that time, at least 50 Ahmadiyya mosques have been vandalized and 36 mosques and meeting places shut down. In parts of East and West Java and elsewhere, extremists pressure local officials to close places of worship or ban Ahmadiyya activity altogether. In Saudi Arabia, Ahmadiyya members have been deported for their beliefs. In Egypt, they have been charged under its blasphemy laws. In 2010, I'm proud to say that USERF's intervention helped a number of members leave Egypt for safety abroad. Now let's be clear. The message of the Ahmadiyya community is a positive call for world harmony and liberty. It points beyond today's sufferings to tomorrow's hopes and dreams. Nonetheless, if we are to stand for these principles, we who believe in peace and freedom dare not be silent. We must take a stand for those who face persecution wherever and whenever it occurs. So, what can we do? First, we must realize that the same societies that violate the religious freedom of the Ahmadiyya also abuse the rights of others. As Yusuf has documented, where Ahmadiyya suffer, Hindus and Christians, Sikhs and Baha'is, Shia and other Muslims often are persecuted as well. Second, in order to protect the rights of all, including the Ahmadiyya, and foster peaceful, stable societies, we who are in Washington must make religious freedom a truly compelling foreign policy priority woven into every aspect of our relationships with other countries. Finally, the United States government should specifically confront governments which target the Ahmadiyya. It should urge Pakistan to amend its constitution and rescind all anti-Ahmadiyya laws. It should urge Indonesia to overturn its 2008 decree and all provincial bans against Ahmadiyya religious practice. It should press both governments to investigate acts of violence thoroughly and prosecute perpetrators vigorously. And until Pakistan proves itself to be serious about reform, Yusuf believes that it does qualify as a country of particular concern. Speaking for the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, let me conclude by saying that we will continue to stand for the right of people everywhere to think as they please, believe or not believe as they wish, 
peacefully practice their beliefs and express them publicly without fear or intimidation. We are proud to stand with the Ahmadiyya community and proclaim together that these and other freedoms are the birthright of humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you.